All right, all right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the 411 Ground and Pound MMA podcast. We are your weekly look into the wide, wacky, wonderful world of mixed martial arts. My name is Robert Winfrey, and I'm your host, per usual. And for usual, thank you all very much for listening. Any way you can interact with the product, um, I know some of you guys do, some of you don't, and look, guys, if you can, great. If you're worried about it or you don't want to and you just want to listen, cool. I am not here to pass judgment on anyone. But any, you know, like, comment, subscribe, star rating, written review, whatever helps feed the algorithm and is applicable to your podcast platform of choice. I'm good with any and all of it, so. Or, again, just listening. Happy with, the, more than happy with that, so. Appreciate the heck out of you guys. All right, on the agenda this evening, we have a review of UFC on ESPN 55, a thoroughly forgettable event, with a couple of exceptions, at least one, um, an, uh, anomaly's the wrong word, one random first, random first, uh, for the UFC, and then we will preview UFC 301, they're back on pay-per-view, and I've brought... Eh, look, I spent some time defending it a little bit last week. I'm going to stand by that. This is not, in my estimation on paper, worth the price of the UFC pay-per-view these days. It's the worst that they've got on the calendar thus far for the year. But it's not the drizzling. <laughs> you know, I, I, I lived through a lot worse. I've covered... Yeah, you know what? No, I've covered worse. I've written about and covered worse than this. Um, this is still lower. This is still low end, right? If we if we have the spectrum, this is subpar. But I'm not going to get out here and say, oh, this is dreadful. Well, no, I don't think it's dreadful. I don't think it's worth 80 bucks, but, you know, that's just me. Your mileage will vary. So we'll preview that, and we'll talk a little bit about news. A um, couple of smaller things that need to be gone over, I guess. So tune in for... Well, stay tuned for that. Um, okay, I think that's everything as far as the intro goes. So let's jump in, shall we? UFC on ESPN 55 came our way on Saturday. Started at 4 Eastern, I believe the prelims. So done... R- Earlier than you, a little bit earlier than usual. Um, okay, how did we do prediction wise? On a 13 fight card, which eh, it's pushing it, um, nine and four. Nine and four. And one of those I don't. Let me, I'm not going to talk about the fight just yet, but hear me out on this one. I'm, I'm going to keep it in the, six, in the correct column. I'm going to explain why I don't feel good about it. So, um, uh, one of the earlier fights on the card, um, it was Yamas, I mispronounced it as James, it's from Peru, that would be Yamas, um, Yamas, uh, Yontop, who, when I previewed this, uh, was scheduled to fight Gabe Green, and I picked Gabe Green. Apparently that fight didn't happen, um, Green fell out or some such, or it was announced before it was official, uh, before it was officially signed, I don't know. Long story short... Um, he was replaced by Chris Padilla. Um, and I didn't realize this was a swap of opponents until um, way too late to feel comfortable making a pick. Or I mean, we were almost like at the fight. Like it started and I was updating my spreadsheet and I went, oh, wait a minute. This doesn't make sense. Oh, I this is not the fight that I originally predicted. Um, and my logic was pretty much just I didn't pick Yon Top, so I'm going with the other guy. And Yon Top was favored pretty heavily. Uh, I just I don't feel good about that because again there was no thought put into it. I could have just as easily looked at that and gone well. Picking the guy who's not coming in on short notice. Um, so, again, I don't feel very good about that one. I'm still counting it, but I don't feel good about that one. Got the main and co-main wrong. Only the co-main annoyed me because yeah, I knew it. I knew it. Spent a bunch of time last last week going, you know, don't know about Ryan Spann. Just don't know about him. And, well, 
Ryan Spann just has a good first round in him, and that's kind of it. Um, I, what was the other one I got wrong? What are the other ones I got wrong? Um, Pearson Onama I got wrong. I don't know what happened to Jonathan Pierce, man. But that dude has fall. Maybe there's just enough tape on him at this point, but he's he's on hard times. Um, what's the other one I got wrong? I didn't feel great about... Some of these I got right, even. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Dante Mays and uh, Kyle Machado. That was not a good fight. In fact, I might go on my list, on my list like, worst of the year. Um, yeah, that was it, actually. So, Pearson Onama, Main and Comain, and then, um, yeah, Machado and uh, Maze. So, I'll take 9 and 4. I'm okay with that. Uh, that brings us on the year to 116 and 57. Just a little better than 2 to 1. Um, three no contest thrown in there for good measure. I'm okay. Uh, again, all I want to do is be better than 50 50. So if I'm about two to one, uh, I'm, I'm happy. I'm very, very happy with that. So that's good. Uh, okay. As for the fights themselves, main event, um, Alex Perez defeats, uh, Matthews Nikolau via knockout punches, uh, two sixteen of the second round. Is it Mateus? Mateusz Nikolaou. God, I can never remember that guy. Um, slower first round. Both guys kind of just getting a feel for things. I think I gave Nikolaou a slight edge there, but not much. Perez had a pretty decent combination at one point. Just some good movement by both guys. Um, second round, things pick up, and then Nikolaou gets buzzed by a punch and never... Doesn't seem to get his feet back under him. I mean, the fight goes on a little bit. The the punch I'm talking about is not the one that knocked him out. Um, he gets hit and he gets, again, just kind of buzzed. And Perez able to apply enough pressure, get him against the fence, knocks him out. Um, much needed win for Perez. You know, guy hadn't won a fight since June of 2020. Um, now, granted... I think I talked about this a little bit. Like, you know, you lose a title fight, fight with Davis and Figueredo, okay. You lose to Pantoja, who becomes the next champion, okay. You lose to Mohamed Makayev, eh, I'm, I mean, I'm just not high on Makayev. Um, but, you, know, you do well in that fight, and you certainly make a case that if it had been five rounds instead of three, you would have, this is a real chance you would have won that. Um... That Nikolaou seems, eh, again, another guy that there might just kind of be enough tape out there at this point to have started to figure him out. Um, Perez, you know, did the, I'm, I want to get into a title shot. You're not getting a title shot off of this. Well, I don't know, man. Steve Ursag, who's ranked like 10, is getting a title shot because the UFC operates on the who's next, who's ready and available on our timetable. So... I find it unlikely that he gets a title shot off of this, let me just put it like that. Um, pretty big setback for Nikolau. Um, guy had some pretty serious momentum at one point, uh, very recently, and then last couple of fights, it's just, it's not quite looked like it's there. Like there's some component missing. Um, yeah. Co-main event, um, Ryan Spann is a pretty good first round against Bogdan Gushkov. Gets him down, has him mounted at the end of the round, but Span can't quite maintain the intensity. Gets hit. There were a couple of really nice uppercuts uh, finishes on this card. This one, and then, uh, what was the other one? Um, guy knocked out, uh, Uros Medic. Hit a really nice uppercut on Tim Means, but there was a good one here from Gushkov that dropped Span, and then the referee let Span take way too many punches. Um, I understand maybe not jumping in as soon as he drops, but there were like almost double digit punches landed. You didn't need to see him get hit that many times. Man, you just didn't. So solid solid enough win for Gushkov, mostly because light heavyweight sucks. So and then yeah, that will be the last time I pick Ryan Span, unless I have a profoundly compelling reason.
to go the other way on that. Uh, let's see. Karini Silva defeated Ariane uh, Da Silva, formerly Ariane Lipsky. 229-28 and 30-27. Not a whole lot here. Um, there were a couple of decent scrambles, but mostly it was just uh, De Silva being a little better on the feet, and then anytime they tied up, uh, Silva's a superior grappler. Not superior enough to really force things and get a finish, but superior enough to do enough control, land enough ground and pound to, you know, win enough of the rounds at least. Heavyweight, um, Jonata Denise defeated Austin Lane via knockout punches, 212 of the second. Lane with a big first round. Could have gone 10-8 here. Um, got Denise down. Uh, and he really struggled to try and get out from under him. Again, had mount at one point. Uh, just you know, really overall solid stuff from Lane in, this, in that first round. But another guy who couldn't quite maintain... Uh, the intensity, maintained the pace, slowed down dramatically in the second, tried to strike a bit too much with a guy who's got a fairly legitimate kickboxing resume and got knocked out because of it. Uh, let's see, next up at a catchweight because David Onama missed weight. David Onama defeats Jonathan Pierce for unanimous decision, 29-28s across the board. Not a lot of controversy there. Um, Pierce for a while looked like he was going to be a really tough wrestler to deal with. And the last couple of fights, it turns out, he's still got takedowns, but his offensive output is limited if he doesn't have a giant gap over you. And, I mean, Onama was doing stuff here that I was surprised was working, but it was. He's just constantly bridging and turning in, um, especially to the body. It's one of the ways, to, it's one of the ways to potentially deal with the body triangle. Um, get to a hip. Doesn't really matter which one. It's slightly preferable to put the lock on the floor, but it's not again not necessary. With the hips slightly more immobilized, it actually lets you generate a little bit more um, space and control, especially if you can get the lock a little bit off of your hips. Most body triangles are kind of just around the belly, and if you can you know isolate that a little bit, then it does make turning into that a bit easier than trying to turn into someone who just has hooks, especially if they know what they're doing. Hooks let you apply pressure to the hips and legs and really mitigate some of that threat. And Pierce has never adapted. Um, and then we, the ending of this was just comical. Um, it, it, it's that, you know, that joke about, I want to see, you know, Gagey and Holloway. We have Gagey and Holloway at home, and this was Gagey and Holloway at home. Um, yeah, not a lot here as far as that goes. But, I again, I really wonder what happened to Pierce. Um, because his rides are usually pretty good, but it just feels like people have figured out some of his habits, and he's really struggled to find a second gear to work through or a second avenue to victory. Um, and then at welterweight, I mentioned already, Uroš Medic, uh, TKO's Tim Means, really nice uppercut, 201 of the first. Um... Means employing a little bit more wrestling these days. Got a little bit too predictable with it, and Medich read his intent. He level changed into an uppercut, and that was all she wrote. Uh, Medich pretty good. Let's see. Uh, bantamweight. Victor Henry defeated Ronnie Yaya via TKO three. Excuse me, 236 of the third. Um, Ronnie Yaya, man, that dude made his professional debut in 2002. I was still in high school. Somehow this man has like the... He, you look at that man's face, he doesn't look like he's only 39. And again, he's always looked old for his age, but... Uh, respect to him for being out here. Had a decent first round. I, uh, I think I still gave it to Henry, but... Yaya did some stuff in that first round. I might have given it to Yaya, I don't remember. Uh, but Henry just kind of absorbed some of that. Uh, kept up the pressure... A lot of good combination work from Henry, some good movement, uh, especially when Yaya would try to come forward. He tried not to get stuck along the fence, did Henry. And started digging to the body into the second round because Yaya's guard was very high, especially when he started throwing longer combinations. One of the reasons you throw longer combinations to the head. Their guard comes up and exposes the body. 
Um, Victor Henry, he had some really nice counter wrestling too. Um, Ronnie Yaya, not the world's greatest takedown artist, but he knows how to get you down if he needs to, and he knows how to force some grappling exchanges that favor him. And Henry struggled a little bit in the first round to reliably disengage, but once we got into the second, just nothing for Yaya. I gave him nothing. Uh, uh, pretty good win for Henry. Uh, again, I, I have a lot of respect for Yaya. I don't know how much longer he's going to be doing this, but it was a good, that was a pretty good win. Lightweight Austin Hubbard defeated uh, Mikhail Figlak for unanimous decision, 29-28s across the board. This was a decent little fight. Nothing great, but... Um, Hubbard able to start counter-wrestling later in the fight. Figlak, he fell just behind a little bit um, as far as overall activities the fight wore on. And a lot of this fight was dictated by like who was going forward. Um, neither guy exceptional off the back foot at this point in their careers. And Hubbard just got a little bit more done overall. But again, it was a fun, fun enough little fight. A significantly less than fun fight, and certainly not little. Dante Almeida defeated Kyle Machado of unanimous decision. 29-28s across the board. Not a lot to talk about here, just crappy heavyweight striking. Daniel Cormier saying at the beginning of this fight, man, I love heavyweight fights. These are just the best. They're just further cementing himself as a stooge and the worst commentator that the UFC employs. There's no way he said that with a straight face. He can't be that deluded. Uh, straw weight. Ketlin Souza defeated Marnik Mann the unanimous decision. 30-27 across the boards. Mann just really struggled once Souza started landing. She does not react well to being hit. She had moments of success. I, I, I certainly don't mean... Especially as the fight wore on, actually. like uh, The third round, I think, might have been her best, really. She still lost it, but she... That was maybe the most competitive. Um... Mentioned already the catch weight, Chris uh, 156 and a half because uh, Yamas Yontop missed weight. But Chris Padilla choked him out, 433 of the first. A lot of uh, athletic, explosive stuff from Yontop, especially um, in the wrestling and the grappling. Here's the problem, man. He started skipping steps, just trying to get through it with speed and athleticism. And you can try to speed run those but it means you better have every detail down pat because if you screw it up, you're going to get countered and you're going to be put in a bad spot. And that's what happened to him here. He was trying to escape, um, uh, but he had him down half guard. I, uh, it was either half guard or side control. I want to say half guard. And he's, you know, doing some of the stuff you're supposed to do, trying to get to his knees and stand, but he misses an underhook. Um, he's, he tries to shoot it, but he tries to shoot it as the rest of his body's moving. And that means if he misses it, he winds up in a really bad spot. Because normally you have the underhook to help move them around and prevent them from getting around to your back. And he didn't have that. So when he missed firing that underhook while simultaneously shrimping and doing a little bit of like rolling to his knees, it meant Padilla was very free to just let him spin and give up his own back. Get the back, get the choke. Very quick finish from Padilla there. Uh, good stuff from him. All right, um, Ivana Petrovic defeated Leong Na via arm triangle, 129 of the third. Na has a, another one of these fighters with a pretty good first round, but it all kind of falls apart after that, and it fell apart for her here uh, in a pretty big way down the stretch. Now, this, is, this was, again, an arm triangle kind of from the side, more the back, really which is a more difficult choke to finish. There's some nuance to how you have to get your arms around and where your pressure goes. But a lot of people bail on the arm triangle as soon as they kind of lose traditional like mount or side control. And uh, I mean, Brian Ortega's one that he hit on Yair Rodriguez was a much cleaner, more technical example of how to do it from something other than the traditional um, uh, chest-to-chest kind of thing. It's not actually chest to chest, but you know what I mean. Uh, n and another example here, uh, commentary mentioned, you know, it helps when your opponent's really tired, and Na was definitely tired by the end of this one. So, but again, a lot of guys kind of bail on it because they're not, they either don't know or are not uh, willing to make some adjustments to 
try and keep that because you can definitely choke someone from the back with a slightly modified arm triangle position. Like that, it's not easy, and there's a reason you try to get at least one of your arms, you know, through uh, through the grip of someone when they're trying to choke you. But it's very possible to still get a submission there with with an arm trapped. Usually, you only do it on guys again much less experienced than you or who are very tired, but. Uh, it, I'm glad to see it making a bit more of a... The side arm triangle, especially in no-gi grappling, had kind of regained prominence the last uh, handful of years. Again, not, you're not seeing it at like the highest of levels, but you did start seeing it a little bit more and more, and seeing that make its way back into MMA is a, an interesting development. And kicking everything off, uh, Mahashate defeated Gabriel Benitez via split decision, 29-28. I'm fine with that. Um, not a gr- not a bad fight, but not a great fight. I also had to watch that fight with the Spanish commentary on. Um, I other people have had more issues with ESPN Plus using it as a service than I have. I had first somewhat major issue uh, for this card. I couldn't find the ESPN Plus stream only had the Spanish option available until for me until like halfway through the second fight. Um, which is really awkward. The... There was another option where that was streaming the ESPN2 feed, but you have to sign in with your TV provider for that. And I'm, because I ditched Comcast and got Google Fiber recently, um, I don't actually have a television provider. I'm working on that, but... I couldn't sign into that one, because I don't have a TV provider. And the Plus... The Genuine Plus app, again, it took forever for the... Uh, English commentary feed to load. So first time I've had a real issue with something that they've been doing. I don't know, I don't know who botched that, but somebody over there did. So there was that. Um, yeah, that was the card. There was no fight of the night. Okay, that's that's fair in all honesty. If I had to give a fight of the night, where would I have gone? Um. I couldn't, in good good conscience, give it to Onama and Pierce, not just because Onama missed weight, but... No, I'm I'm actually... Hubbard and Figlack, maybe, and if that's the best we can muster up for that discussion, then, yeah, it's okay to... So, your performances, they were excellent ones. They went to Alex Perez, Bogdan Gushkov, Jonata Deniz, and Erdos Medic. So, get a finish on the main card, get a bonus. Um, anybody get kind of shortchanged on that? Victor Henry a little bit, that poor guy. Because he turned in, he had a really good performance. And honestly, I might have, I loved the way Padilla took the back and got that choke. But again, I am not in charge of any of this, so that's just my opinion. All right, that, again, that's it. Full report can be found in the MMAZona411mania.com. Go give it a read if you are so inclined. That is always appreciated. Okay, let us begin the process of ah, moving on then, shall we? Sorry about that. Okay. Wow, that did not take any time at all. It's a lot to talk about. All right, uh, this Saturday, UFC 301. We're back on pay-per-view for a card that, much as I will defend pretty big chunks of this, is not. it's not worth what they charge for pay-per-views. It's a long card, too. Jeez, hang on. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 fights. Oy, that's a lot. That's going to be rough. Yeah, that's just going to be rough. Oh, well. That's why I get paid the big bucks, right? (laughs) Hey. Okay, main event. Flyweight title fight. Alexandre Pantoja goes for his second title defense. He has... um, Yeah, he defended against Brandon Royval after beating Brandon Moreno for it. This guy just beats on Brandon's, I guess. Um, not fighting a Brandon this time. He's fighting Steve Urseg. Now, I already mentioned, but Steve Urseg is ranked, I believe, number 10. 
He is, in fact, number 10. Um, he's, what, 3-0, and 4-0 in the UFC? I mean, he's shown some pretty serious potential. 3-0. and Shown some good potential. Serious might be a slight exaggeration based on current evidence. But, you know, an 11-fight winning streak, 3-0 in the UFC, this is, this is all, like, positive stuff. Curious about him getting the title shot, but again, it's, you know, who's available on the schedule. It, the more time gets away from the UFC 300 and the more we look at, like, how 300, 301, and 302 are kind of shaping up. Feels even more like we sh- it's fairly obvious that the UFC originally intended Alex Pereira and... Jamal Hill to be the main event for this card. And I don't say that as a slight to these fighters uh, at all. At all, at all. Please don't uh, take that the wrong way. But the UFC is still reluctant to main event with flyweights in general. They're they're reluctant to main event pay-per-views with a flyweight title fight. They have their reasons, some of which make sense, some of which don't. But they couldn't get whatever they really wanted for 300 to be the main event, so they slapped that one in there. A um, little bit unfortunate that they are not giving Alex Pereira a fight on this card. We could replace a bunch of these fights with anything involving him potentially at heavyweight, and it would be more interesting by a non-trivial margin. Uh, yeah, but there, that's, that's all that. Um, anyway, main event. You know... If I had, um, uh, how do I phrase this? Look, everyone's favoring Pantoja fairly, I think. I don't think it's unfair to favor him. He's faced the better opposition. He's a more proven commodity at this level. Like, there's a lot of reasons to favor Pantoja. But... If you are prone to understanding some of the randomness and sort of how some of these ebbs and flows work as it pertains to the state of MMA, if I was willing to go in on that, I would pick Ursig here. I'll tell you why. Much as I respect Pantoja, and I, I really do, he is 34. He is freshly 34. He turned 34 in April, so freshly 34. But that's getting up there towards that horrible line of demarcation at fly at like you know again lightweight and below or welterweight and below, depending on how you, on how you feel about welterweight. He's also had a couple of really hard fights in relatively quick succession. So, 2023, he has two wars. I mean, that fight with Brandon Moreno at UFC 290, that's July. And that that was the fight of the year, I think, for most people for 2023, certainly for me. A great fight, but a back-and-forth war in the trenches. His fight with Brandon Royville is similar. It's not quite to the same level, and that was December of that same year. So, in July to December, and then December to now, it's not that it's impossible to recover from these fights in, you know, sort of the timely fashion in which he is doing them. Because he's not going, he's not fighting inadvisably close to these things. But he is... It, it just adds up, man. Now, in fairness, another thing, you know, Pantoja's never been finished. All of his losses are by decision. And I'm, again, I favor him by all, you know, logically. But a couple of really, really tough fights back to back. A guy against a guy who is talented, talent, but a bit unproven. Sorry there. 
Um, Urseg has pretty smooth boxing. He's got good pop. Um, I think he's hurt. He only he only has the one knockout win in the UFC, but he did some damage to the other guys he beat. Like, I get favoring Pantoja. I really do. I'm probably going to pick him. I don't know. Do I care that much about my record at the end of the day? More importantly, do I... The question is not do I care about my record. I mean, sort of, but... Do I believe that... Just because I can see how Urseg might win, does that mean I think it is most likely? Under a lot of circumstances, no, this is not the most likely thing. Um, Urseg's only 28. That was a good knockout of Matt Schnell. It really was. Am I really going to talk myself into this? He's not fought anybody near the level of Alexandre Pantoja. And that, I mean, that's not his fault. He's beaten pretty much everyone that's been put in front of him. I mean, one earlier loss in his career. Like, he lost his second ever fight, and he hasn't lost since. So, I mean, you, and you can only fight the guys they put in front of you. So, it, he's had a reasonable escalation of talent to this point. Debuts against David Dvorak. Scores a non-trivial upset. Dvorak I, was one of those guys I think a lot of us had decent expectations for. Beats Alessandro Costa. Knocks out Matt Schnell. That was fairly recently. That was March of last year. The quick turnaround, I don't know if that will favor him or not. The Schnell fight wasn't exactly, you know, some again, in the trenches war, though, so I don't expect it to be a huge detriment to try to prepare on short on a quicker turnaround in this case. Pantoja's grappling is just so good. The more it stays on the feet, the less I like his chances. But Urseg also likes to box kind of in the pocket rather than you know, longer range stuff. And if you hang out in the pocket with Pantoja, you're asking to get grappled. And that's that's a problem. Uh, if he does pull this off, I'm going to feel like an idiot for not going with Urseg. When I've sat here and hemmed and hawed a little bit about this. All right. I'm going with Pantoja. He is the most logical choice. Choice, But be aware, I, this is the kind of circumstance, all things considered, where the MMA, the realities of MMA, try to, will force you to reorient. So, uh, be aware of that. All right, co-main event. Fighting out his contract now. Uh, one more fight in his native Brazil, in his native Rio de Janeiro. All-time MMA great, Jose Aldo. Returns to the UFC. He had allegedly retired after losing to Marab Really Took a boxing bout in between now and then. Wants to fight out his contract now, so whatever he does next, he doesn't have to deal with the UFC anymore. And he's fighting Jonathan Martinez. This is a bantamweight. Whew. I think very highly of Jonathan Martinez. I think that should be fairly well known at this point. He's on a long winning streak. Um, well, long-ish. It's what, five, six, six fights. A um, couple of leg kick finishes. Coming off a good win over Adrian Yanez. Um that win over Saeed Nurmagomedov was really, really impressive, too. He kicks really hard. Here's my problem with this. If Martinez has a couple of issues that he's still working out, his hands are still a work in progress. I don't think they're bad, but his kicks are really where he does the majority of his work. And that's not a bad thing if you if that's your strong weapon, know how to incorporate it. But the hands are a little bit of an issue. Some of his defensive tendencies are built around fighting at range. Again, fighting at kicking range predominantly. 
when things get a little bit closer, he's he's not the same fighter. And that's you know, that sounds like I'm being if that sounds like I'm being overly negative, I'm not. Everybody fights differently at different ranges. Some guys are more comfortable in close. Some guys are more. There are plenty of guys who are killers in close, who look very awkward fighting at distance, and of course, vice versa. That's the whole thing. Martinez still doesn't feel like he's super comfortable in in pure boxing range. Um, does a lot of circling to try and maintain distance, which is perfectly valid. It's worked for him. It's work, currently working. He He'll put some damage on you. I think part of the problem here is, and maybe this is me still having a bit too many rose-colored thoughts about Jose Aldo, he stops kicks. Like, trying to out... I don't even mean, that, like, when I say trying to outkick him, I don't even necessarily mean that, like, trading kicks with him, which is... He hasn't thrown a lot of kicks lately, you know, Aldo originally you know, a leg-kicking monster. Backed off of that as his career went on for either injury reasons or just um, stylistic choices, whatever it happened. I mean, I'm sure there were a lot of reasons. But he always retained the ability to deal with people kicking at him. His his stoppage of kicks, checks, moving out of the way, what, it's it's on such automatic that it's not impossible to outleg kick him, but if you're not like, because Volkanovski kind of did it. A lot of picking at him with leg kicks with superb timing and movement to set them up. I don't mean this is a knock on Jonathan Martinez, but with respect to movement and timing of these things, he's not demonstrated to be like Volkanovski when Volkanovski was on the ascent nearly at his best. Very few people ever get there. I mean, I'm not trying to knock Martinez there, but that's just if you're going to try and beat Jose Aldo with those tools, that's a that can be a really difficult task. He's very good about shutting down people kicking at him. He's got the better hands. He's got a laser jab. His defense is generally very, very good. This is only a three-round fight. The emotion's going to be with him. And there's a lot of stylistic ways that, depending on how far he might have slipped since his last fight, that this does actually favor Jose Aldo. This might be an overly emotional pick on my part. I'm going with Jose Aldo. Um, and I, I like Jonathan Martinez. I really do. But something about the way this is going to be, the way this like lines up in my head, I am just not certain at all about this going for Martinez. Unfortunate, this what the original plan, I think everyone's more or less confirmed this, they kind of mm-hmm. wanted this to be Jose Aldo versus Dominic Cruz, which has been a dream fight for like a decade at this point. Unfortunately, something came up and Cruz was unable to make the date. I don't know exactly what it was. But uh, but I would have favored Aldo for that, too. Not by the again, not by the largest of margins, but. Just how they kind of match up and and my respect for the career of Dominic Cruz is very well documented. But I, I kind of think Aldo might have something for him. I don't know what Martinez's game looks like and what he does successfully if his kicking game is hampered in a significant way. And Jose Aldo is definitely going to hamper his kicking. So I'm going with Aldo. A little bit emotional pick there because Aldo is great. I have I watched the vast majority of his which of his WEC fights did I miss? Um, I didn't watch his ridiculous knockout of Cub Swanson live. I wound up catching that um, after the fact. I'd heard, I I knew of him before that, and I, again, I'd seen some highlights and some fights, but the first, fi- I actually think the first fight I saw of his live was his title fight when he beat Mike Brown. Um. 
Yeah, guy. Nothing but respect for Jose Aldo. All right, light heavyweights because, of course, um, Anthony Smith. You know, do I want to make the jokes about him and Bogdan Gushkov and how much they look alike? <laughs> no, I'm not going to. I'll leave that alone. Um, Smith, who is still out here saying I can be a title contender. Out here, you know, saying, boy, there's all these holes in the game of Alex Pereira. And don't get me wrong, Pereira is... He's a limited fighter in MMA terms in a lot of respects, but he has shored up enough of some of those deficiencies to be a giant problem and a deserving champion. Whereas Anthony Smith is one and three in his last four. And that win is a split decision that could have easily gone the other way. And his last time out, he was TKO'd by Khalil Roundtree. He's fighting Vitor Petrino, and this might kind of be do or die for Smith. Um, Petrino, 11 and 0, very physically imposing, 2 and 0 in the UFC, if memory serves. Well, 4 and 0. Good grief! How have I forgotten all this guy's fights? Okay, which of these? Okay, I'd forgotten the Anton Turkali fight. I'd also kind of blocked out the Marching Procneo fight. Um, I'm not trying to be dismissive of Anthony Smith here. I'm really not. Oh, well, Aldo's the underdog. Not by a huge amount, but... Hmm. That, shouldn't be, that really shouldn't surprise me. Um, I... I Look, I respect Anthony Smith's career. That's a guy who ground his way towards success. That guy been on the tough regional scene forever. Tried, you know, fought for. Didn't he fight at welterweight for a bit? I know he fought at middleweight. Certainly, I gotta double check that. I don't want to say anything untrue there. Um. No, just middleweight. Okay. But, you know. This guy fought his way for a long time. Uh, and he fought a lot of very talented people, and again, I have nothing but respect for him. But I, I think he's... I think at this point he's fairly shop-worn, and... I think this is the wrong kind of guy to be shop worn against. So going with Petrino. The guy's putting Smith at like plus 400. That seems a bit much. I don't know that I necessarily agree that he's that big an underdog, but eh. Uh, middleweight's next. Michelle Pereira and Ijo Portieria. Um, at this point, I think it's fairly well established that I just don't really pick Portieria to win. He's 2-3 and three in the UFC. He did win against Robert Breitschek his last time out, but he missed weight. Um, yeah, Michelle Pereira at middleweight has been... Made me wonder why he wasn't there sooner. Like, this guy, he looks like a big middleweight, and he was a big welterweight. Seems energized, has finally kind of dialed in. A little bit of his wildness, retain enough of the edge to be unpredictable, but found a framework for it, so he's not, you know, trying backflips off the cage or whatnot, like a buffoon. Um, I don't have much of a reason to pick Potieria here. I don't really pick him in general to win fights. I have no intention of picking him to win this one. So... Going with Michelle Pereira to continue making waves at middleweight. And kicking off the main card, we have Paul Craig and Caio Bahalio. Fairly simple pick here. I don't... Again, Paul Craig, another guy I don't dislike. He's only 36. Um, but... Um, Caio Bahalio is... Kind of making some waves here. This dude hasn't lost since 2015. 
um, what, 5-0 and oh in the, U- sorry, not 5, yeah, 5-0 and oh actually in the UFC, or 4, 1, 2, 3, yeah, 5, 5-0 five oh in the UFC, um, Bahalio definitely seems like a guy moving up, and Craig seems more like a guy who's kind of treading water. That sounds more insulting than I mean it to be, but I need... I'm at the point where I need a really good reason to pick against Bahalio. Ah. Dang it, I can't remember to spell his name. A-L-H-O. Yeah. So, going with Bahalio there. Not a lot of reservations in that pick either. Uh, and that's the main card. Again, not the best pay-per-view card the UFC's ever put on. Not the best card they put on this year. <sighs> Might be the worst... Would this be the worst one of the last 18 months? It might. You could definitely argue it. I can't think of anything that I would object... That I would immediately say was worse off the top of my head. So we'll say at a bare minimum it's arguable. All right, prelims. We have Jack Shore and Joe Anderson Brito. Um, Shore... Had a little bit of a setback when he fought Ricky Simone. I mean, they gave him a pretty... That was all, He had a good run at Bantamweight, then moved up to Featherweight, beat Makwan Amirkani, but, you know, Makwan Amirkani is kind of a joke. That's a bit too... That's a bit too harsh. He's very well figured out at this point, is a better way to phrase that. Um, and Joe Anderson Brito, coming off of that win over... Um, he beat... Jo- was Jonathan Pierce's last fight? I think it was. Yeah, he ninja choked him. I, I was trying to remember if he'd had a fight after that or not. Um, Shore's a tough out. He really is. He's a little undersized for featherweight. Not hugely undersized, a little bit. And Brito has had some wrestling problems, not just with Pierce, but he's dealt, he's you know kind of pushed through them thus far. I kind of like Brito here, um, but I'm not trying to sleep on shore. I just I think fairly highly of Brito. And let's see, Strawway, Karolina Kovalkiewicz, and Yasmin Lucindo. Hmm. Kovalkiewicz is fairly well known at this point. Lucindo, fifteen and five, two and one in the UFC. It's a decent step up for her from Pollyanna Viana to Karolina Kovalkiewicz. And again, Karolina's not exactly set the world on fire. She's on a, in fairness, she's on a four-fight winning streak. I mean, she took a serious step down in competition for a little, I mean, no. Like, Jessica Penne in 2021 is not, no disrespect to Jessica Penne, but that's not cream of the crop. Beat Felice, uh, Felice Herrig was kind of your last shot, and then Silvana gomez Juarez, Vanessa Demopoulos, Deanna Belbeach. Again, this is a... They put her in rebuilding mode. And very, very obviously. And on the plus side, you know, it seems to be bearing fruit. Tough one there. Odds are heavily with Lucindo. Not sure I agree with them being as heavy as they are. And then Kovalkiewicz is 38. That's a that's a thing. Yeah, let me go with the odds this time. I'll go with Lucindo, but I don't think I do not think this fight is as wide as the odds are indicating. Uh, lightweight, we have Elvis Brenner and Mick Tebek Urlbay. Check something here. Brenner, 16 and 3. Um, oh, right. He had that wild fight with Guron Kuta Deladze. Knocked out Kainen Krzyzewski that, after that. 3 0 in the UFC. Um, Brenner seems like he's doing some decent work. Um, not sure it's going to matter against Ortolbai, who's 12 1 and 1. Seven fight winning streak. Only one UFC win, but he beat Oros Medic, and that is nothing to sneeze at. This is a stiff test for Oral by. 
I'm very clear about that because Brenner is no joke. But I'm I'm gonna go with Earl Bay, I think. Um yeah, yeah I am. I I don't know. I I'm not trying to discount Brenner because he's in you're gonna have to you're gonna have to put that guy down. Like he had a really tough couple of rounds against Guram Kuta de Ladze and just never gave up. Kept on fighting that whole time. Uh, but I, I, I'm going to go with Ordo by. Uh, let's see. And then at Featherweight, we have Jean Silva and William Gomez. Um, Silva, 12 and 2. Made his UFC debut. Not, oh, I remember this guy. This is the guy that took forever and a day to walk to the cage. And he beat Weston Wilson. Um, Gomez, 13 and 2. In a decent streak at the moment. Very good streak overall, actually. His last loss was to Morgan Chaudier in 2016. Um, he's, what, 3-0 and in the UFC? Yeah. He's a pretty good fight, actually. Silva might have this power edge, but he's a little bit... Not quite as dynamic. Um, Gomez a little bit more proven... Odds are with Silva. They were very impressed with his debut, I guess. I'm actually going to go with Gomez. Um, might be very foolish of me, but... I don't only pick favorites. I, you all know me at this point. Um, that's our middle prelims, our early prelims. Lightweight uh, Joaquim Silva. Neto BJJ making his yearly appearance. <laughs> yep. Last fought December of 23. I fought in June of 23 and got stopped by so this guy. That's like Daniel Cormier, this guy. Silva had a lot of ability, a lot of promise, but if you guys are wondering what I'm talking about here, his debut in the UFC was in 2015. He fought once. He fought once in 16, once in 17, twice in 18, once in 19, missed 2020, once in 21, once in 22. He just could not stay healthy and get fights and whatever it happened to be, he just not able to stay active. Um, tough fight for him against Drakkar Close. Close has been putting things back together since he got knocked out by Benil Daryush. 3-0 and since then, wins over uh, Brandon Jenkins, Rafa Garcia. Knocked out Joe Selecki with a really nice slam uh, December of last year when he had like back-to-back -back slam knockouts. Um... There was a time when I would have picked Silva here for the record. He's that he was that good. He showed that much promise. But we're pretty far removed from that um, as far as this point in his career goes. Going with close. That said, man, this, for the record, uh, Silva could absolutely still win this fight. Uh, let's see, lightweight. We have Mauricio uh, Hoofy. And Jamie Malarkey, let me double check Mauricio here. Yeah, Huffy then, I guess. Um, Huffy is 9-1. and one. I believe he's coming off the Contender Series. Yes, he is, where he beat Raimond Magomed, uh, Magomed Aliyev. Four-fight winning streak. That's nothing to be ashamed about. Uh, Malarkey... Going to be a rough welcome for him against Jamie Malarkey. 17-7. and seven. Malarkey been around. He's only 5-5 five and five in the UFC, but he's had some really tough fights with some really good guys. Uh, most recently lost to Nasrat Hakparast. Beat John McDessey before that. Had a really tough fight with Muhammad Naimov. Like, Malarkey will... That is not a soft welcome to the UFC by any stretch of the imagination. Do I think is this a guy from the contender series that's going to be more of the beginning to be less an inspiring a fighter? Mm. He might. If I pick Huffy, it's going to be tea leave reading more than skill set. Oh, then again, let me double check something to Malarkey real fast. Malarkey's only 29. Another guy who looks a lot older than he is. You know what? 
Yeah, I'm going with malarkey. Nuts to that. Um, I again, could be very wrong, but whatever they're trying to pull there, lot, the more they do the contender series as a regular thing, the lower the overall level of talent coming in is. So it's not, it just doesn't mean what it used to mean necessarily. Uh, uh, women's flyweight Dione Barbosa and Ernesta Carde Caracate. Where is she from? Uh, that is the Lithuanian flag. I have no idea how that's supposed to be pronounced. Then. Okay. Um. So Barbosa is six and two. Uh, three fight winning streak. See Ernesta. Could be Karakati. Karakiate. I'm just gonna have to wait until I hear John Anik pronounce it. Sorry guys. Um, I don't have the best handle on Lithuanian pronunciations. Undefeated, 5-0 and one. So there's a draw in there. Five fight winning streak. And obviously it's a five fight winning streak. Well, hang on. Sorry, let me move a few things. So five fight unbeaten streak, three fight winning streak. She again with the draw thrown in there. Huh. I don't quite know on this one. I don't. I genuinely don't really know enough about either woman to make a reliable pick there. So I'll go with the odds. The odds are with Barbosa, so it seems fair. My hunch is Barbosa's fought better opposition to this point, but that's only a hunch. Let's see, lightweight Ismail Bonfim and Vince Pichel is the bloom off the rose for the Bonfim brothers. Uh, I think Ishmael was the one I had a little bit more, a little bit higher appreciation for. He's 19 and four. No, he's the one. Nope, he's the one that uh, got beat by Benoit Santini, which is not a. a Santini is good. So it's his brother, Gabriel, that I thought. I'm, I mean, they both suffered losses recently, but I think it's Gabriel who's got a bit more experience in the UFC and I tend to think a little bit better of. I'm going to pick Vince Pichel here. You know, I like Vince Pichel, but he's 41. Coming off a loss to Mark Madsen, that was a while ago. That was two years ago, a little over. Um, he's had three fights fall out since then. Jesse Ronson, Benoit Santini, and uh, previous attempt to book this fight. I think Bonfim was the reason that fell out. Not that it matters, but just noting. <sighs> Feels like a little bit of a get-well fight for Bonfim. I think logically that's where the pick has to go. Um, I, Whatever it's worth, though, I'm rooting for Pichel here. <laughs> I just... I don't know that I can pick him. And kicking everything off at flyweight, we have Alessandro Costa and Kevin Borjas. So Costa is 13 and 4, 1 and 2 in the UFC, losses to Amir Albazi and Steve Ursig, sandwiching a win over Jimmy Flick. And Borjas is not a Peruvian guy. Um, nine and two. Lost his UFC debut to Joshua Van. That's a tough draw for your debut. Now, see, they booked Joshua Van versus Tatsuro Tyra. Um, the two brightest prospects in that division going to square off. That's a heck of a. I'm, I'm very much looking forward to that fight, actually. Um. Feels a little bit like Costa here, but I'm not sure by how much. Yeah, let me go with Costa, but it's another one again. I am not terribly confident in that particular pick, so that's the card. UFC 301 this Saturday, the MMA Zone of 411mania.com. You know where I will be. Stop by, say hello. I always appreciate it. All right. Uh,
let's move right along here. Uh, so a couple of small news items. One of them, Mark Hunt um, released the made public that he is going to be unsealing a bunch of documents from his lawsuit against the UFC. If you'll recall, he sued them. Um, case took a long time, and he did not win that lawsuit, for the record. It went definitively against him. But a lot of the discovery process and whatnot, he is unsealing, which I believe is perfectly fine for him to do legally. So um, He did all the proper no- channels, notified the court he was going to be doing this. So uh, If anything interesting comes out of that, we'll keep you updated, but just thought you'd potentially be interested that Mark Hunt also... Turns out, darn good chess player, (laughs) Uh, Mr. Hunt. So, good on him um, and for being very good at chess. And curious to see, again, if anything interesting comes out of any of that legal process. Because that was a several-year process. And, again, he lost. That wasn't a, we settled, he lost that case. Um, Some of what he reached for was, again, a little bit of a, overreach in terms of what uh, what he was alleging, but that's also not uncommon. You just throw everything at the wall and see what sticks through a couple of the you know, preliminary hearings and evidentiary findings and whatnot. All right, uh, moving on. I think the last bit of news that I have listed here, uh, the Nevada State Athletic Commission continues to be kind of a joke. So the, on the upcoming uh, commission, uh, their upcoming hearings, meetings, they have scheduled, we have to talk about maybe withholding the purses from people from some of the last UFC events there. Uh, UFC, I think 300 in particular is kind of on the docket. Because, well, Diego Lopez, you see, he uh, he, he jumped over the fence when he celebrated, and we, we really just don't, we really don't like that. They're going to be doing something, they're going to be talking about the guy who um, bit the other guy. <laughs> Um, which, you know what? Fair enough. If you if you feel the need to convene as part of your like agenda to discuss biting, um, you know what? That's actually not unfair. Uh, they also want to talk to Arvin Saryukian because he kind of got into it with a fan when he was walking to the ring when he fought Charles Oliveira. Um, Really, I, I, don't you just think that the, the real punishment for Armin Soyukian should be that he's known forever as a man who punched a fan? Isn't that really the most appropriate punishment? Sorry, I had to dust off that old chestnut. Um, this commission. We're caring about Diego Lopez jumping the fence now, really? Look, I, I understand if you don't want guys to do it, but... This should not be taking up time for this fighter in particular. That's ridiculous. Um, guy throwing hands at a fan. Again, I joke about it, but I can I can understand why that might be something you feel compelled to talk about. But you do nothing to actually protect the fighters. Um, you do nothing to try and deal with the monopolistic practices of the UFC. You do. You could be talking about anything related to what you should be actually doing, and instead it's well, this guy jumped over the fence, and yeah, you guys are a joke. That's really the long and the short of it at this point. It's You're not the biggest joke in the world, but you're kind of a joke. And I really hope you all know it. All right, um, that's it for stuff I had listed. So let me check Twitter, see if anything crazy has gotten out related to MMA. If not, we will do plugs and get out of here. Uh, nope, nothing new, so plugs for me this week. I only see last week. We got together and we reviewed over on Damn You Hollywood, Abigail, which was mostly a good time-ish, goodish, goodish time. Uh, this week on Damn You Hollywood will be on Tuesday, not Monday, for the uh, unfortunate bomb, somewhat unfortunate bomb, uh, Guy Ritchie's The Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare, so... We'll talk about that and all the other stuff coming out from the week and whatnot. So, you know, you know what we do over there on Damn You Hollywood if you're so inclined. Uh, we'll be covering WWE SmackDown on Friday, UFC 301 on Saturday, and we will be back here next week 
to review UFC 301, and we will be previewing... Oy vey. Um, we will be previewing UFC on ESPN 56, Derek Lewis versus Rodrigo Nascimento. How long is this card? Oh, they added more fights. Hang on one. Your co-main event is Alonzo Menafield and Carlos Ulborg. What are you doing? Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Uh, Joaquin Buckley wanted on the card. He's on there. He'll be fighting Nursultan Ruzboyev. Real tough draw. Carlos Diego Fajeda and Mateusz Rembeski. That's a big step up for Rembeski. What else is on this card? Um, I don't care. I don't care. Moderately curious about Chase Hooper and uh, Vyacheslav Borshev. Don't care. Really don't care. Curious about Robelis to Spain and Waldo Cortez Acosta. That's that's an odd choice. That's a very odd choice for all parties involved. Oh, excuse me, it is late here. Um, ooh, Sean Woodson and Alex Caceres. That I don't hate. I don't hate that. Uh, I'm assuming Manafield and Ulberg as the co-main event. It's listed here, but the bout order is not really official yet, apart from inflicting Derek Lewis and Rodrigo Nascimento on us. Why? What did the people of St. Louis do to you? I mean, I'm not exactly the most sympathetic when it comes to Missourians in general for a variety of reasons, but very few people deserve this. Dude has one win in his last... Oh my gosh, he's two and what? Two and five in his last seven? I mean, that fight with Jailton Almeida was painful. It was just awful. Getting another main event? Just Why? It's like Rodrigo Nascimento is some kind of guy like blazing up the ranks either. He's got two split decisions in his last three fights. <laughs> God. Oh, what are we doing? What are we, what are we doing here? You, you guys are gambling everything that Derek Lewis knocks this guy out in 30 seconds. That's it. That's all you got. Because if he doesn't, this is going to suck. It's going to suck so much. Uh, my bet is on this fight sucking out loud, for the record. All right, uh, that's it for me. On that somewhat hilarious note, uh, thank you very much for listening. Faster show this week, which is always appreciated, I imagine. I uh, Thank you guys for listening. Stay safe out there and continue to be well. Be safe and behave.